All right, the series is Soul Winning Verses in Context. And so what we've been doing is taking uh, some commonly used verses that we use when, when we're out soul winning. Basically, we're going through them like you wouldn't do at the door because you don't have time to, to give a whole bunch of explanation about these verses. But what I find very interesting is, uh, and I think I probably mentioned this last week, but the, uh, uh, you know, I have had critics of the soul winning style that, that we do and, and just kind of knocking on doors and giving what we'd call the Romans road. I've heard some critics of that say, uh, you know, they accuse us of just throwing a few verses out of context and then leading people into prayer. And so I remember early on thinking, man, am, are these not in the right context? I mean, are they are they saying something different than what we're make, what we're making them say at the door? And uh, I think it's good to go through these. But again, the the writing is pretty deep. You know, if you remember, Peter even says about Paul's writings, he says they're hard to understand. <laughs> and a lot of people arrest them and make them say things that they don't say. So we should uh, acknowledge then that we're going to have a little bit of a struggle as well in, uh, in, in, in getting what this message says. But first of all, just without the context, what's the verse that we use? Uh, we've already talked about 1 John 5, 13. We've already talked about Romans 3, 23, threw in there Romans 3, 10. And uh, basically all that context is saying the same thing. Now, uh, chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I don't know how you can really take that out of context. It's pretty clear what it says, right? The wages of your sin, what you deserve because of your sin, is death. Now, I suppose you might stop and try to explain to them how it's not just a physical death. Everybody's going to die no matter how you know, much you sinned or didn't sin, everybody's going to die. And if you're preaching the gospel and you go on to say eternal life through Jesus Christ, then you're going to make it spiritual. So you're going to talk about the second death and go to Revelation. I'm not going to deal with all that today. Uh, but we want to look at, again, just as believers, as soul winners, you know, I'm not trying to preach the gospel to you. You already know the gospel. Everybody in here, I'm pretty sure, saved knows the gospel. And so our objective is just to break these down and uh, might not be the most exciting message, but we're going to go through this and look at what exactly is being said in the context. Okay, so soul winning verses in context, looking at Romans 6.23. Obviously, we use this in our soul winning presentation, you know, to show them. Okay, number one, you know, we've all pretty much got the same basic outline, admit you're a sinner. And uh, number two, you know, because of your sins, you deserve to go to hell, basically, is what we're saying. The penalty of your sin is hell. And uh, that's pretty much where we have got them by the time we're using this verse. Okay, so real quickly, uh, let's just get the context of, of the chapters leading up to this. Okay, so we find ourselves in Romans 6. Interestingly, talking about taking things out of context, interestingly, people will use the first part of Romans 6, Romans 6, 1 right there, to, uh, and they will often say, I mean, like the works salvation people, well, I've, I will look at this and be like, well, he says right there, you know, we can't continue in sin. And they're totally taking this verse out of context because that's not what he's saying, okay? So to just back it up a little with a little bit of context, Romans chapter 1. Look at, look at verse 18. I'm going to try to give you a little uh, kind of key verse of each of these chapters. What did Romans chapter 1 say? Look at verse 18. We're pretty familiar with Romans 1, most people in this, uh, in this room right now. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Uh, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal uh, power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart, were dark, heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I was just going to read that one verse, but it's so hard not to. I mean, Paul writes anyway in a run on sentence. And so it's hard not to read the whole thing. Uh, but this is the context of that verse saying, hey, people turn their back on God. 
You know, even though they're without excuse because, you know, there was enough in them to point them to the Lord and that they would seek God. But what they sought instead was unrighteousness. OK, and so uh, they went after those things. And it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. He's going to pour out his wrath against all evil. OK, number uh, chapter two talks about the religious folks. OK. Primarily right there, you'd be thinking about the most of the chapter begins talking about the Jews. And we uh, were talking about this a little bit last week as we got into Romans chapter three. Uh, But look at verse 12, chapter two, verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And so remember, we talked about how the Jews... You know, there were certain things they put into practice and, for instance, circumcision. You know, circumcision, it's clear in the Bible that, that didn't save them. And, uh, and, and Abraham was justified by, by his, you know, it was counted in him for righteousness, his faith in God. And so this happened way before he, he actually followed through with the circumcision. And then the chapter four, you know, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it talks about the circumcision as well. and says, hey, this is just an outward token. You know, this is just a picture. And I kind of compare that to baptism. And uh, we're talking about just things that we do after we are, we are Christians. But of course, these things aren't even things for us anymore. These were things in, un, under the old covenant in the, in the Old Testament. So this is why Paul is so against like holding the Gentile to do these same things because they're not necessarily necessary for salvation and they weren't needed. Let them continue to be Gentiles, but believing Gentiles, let them be Christians. And, uh, and they don't necessarily have to go into the Old Testament laws that were given to uh, to God's people during that time. Okay, so uh, so here, you know, it starts off uh, chapter two, verse one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, o man, whosoever thou art that judgest, uh, judgest for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for for thou uh, that judgest doeth the same thing. And again, he's talking about you know religious people who would look down on the unrighteous, and he they would judge their unrighteous deeds, but then they would go on and do some of those same types of things. And we could all be guilty of that. I mean, none of us in here would probably do some of the, the unnatural sins that are in Romans 1. I sure hope not, you know, because uh, those aren't natural to man. But all the other things in that list probably would be natural to man. Disobedient to parents, you know, and, and, uh, and that whole list of things at the, back, at the uh, end of chapter 1. But he's saying, like, you know, don't do any of these types of behaviors, you you know, or else God's going to pour his wrath on you. That that includes everybody. And so uh, there's this, you know, idea where religious people seem to think that that's going to cover their unrighteousness. And so in chapter three, he needs to point out the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what race you are or what your background is. You have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the big verse in chapter three. So then we uh, talked a little bit about chapter four, how we're justified by faith and not by works. Look at verse five, chapter four, verse five. What a great verse here. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. I mean, I don't know how you could share how how a person that believes in works-based salvation could even get this far in their Bible. (laughs) <laughs> to, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And over and over, this whole book is just blasting people that would think that their works are going to get them to heaven. And he says, uh, you know, we're justified by our faith and not by works over and over. Uh, chapter five, you know, he's really stressing the fact that salvation is a free gift of God. Uh, you know, verse eight's a uh, is uh, not necessarily part of the the uh, key verse that I was going to share, but this is one that we bring up in soul winning as well. I, I didn't uh, I didn't hit that in this series. I probably won't. But it says, "But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath uh, wrath through Him." Look at verse eighteen. Therefore, as by the offense of one, 
judgment came upon all men to condemnation, talking about through the uh, sins of Adam. You know, now the whole human race is, uh, is, con is under condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And man, every verse in here, like I said, is just is just hitting the fact that this is a free gift. In fact, I like to bring to point out to people that in chapter five here, it doesn't only say that salvation is the gift of God, which it is, and we can show you that all through the Bible, Ephesians and Galatians. I mean, everywhere, but it also says free gift. You know, several times it makes some kind of uh, uh, claim towards that. Verse fifteen. But none, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift, right? And it talks about the grace of God. Grace and gift is kind of like the same thing, right? Gift uh, by grace, uh, verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one that uh, uh, one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So there it uses free gift again. And then verse 18, we already pointed out where it says the free gift, which, you know, probably in your soul winning presentation, like mine, we point out the fact that that's what a gift is. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's like, just in case somebody still wants to make that claim. What? <laughs> <laughs> chapter five says it's a free gift. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. You know, you don't have to do anything to earn it. I mean, how you can't, you can't get much clearer than that. All right. So then we come to chapter six and, you know, interestingly enough, it's a great verse and I still use it in my soul winning presentation. Uh, but that's kind of tacked on to the end and the whole verse is just, uh, just finishing out that, that statement. But let's look at the context now of chapter six. So verse one, and this is the first point that I want to make is that grace abounds. Even if we were to continue in sin, well, we will continue in sin, but grace abounds. Like even if we chose, Hey, I'm just not even going to try. I'm just going to go live in sin. Grace still abounds. And that's the implication of this verse. Even though people say the opposite, people say, you know, Oh, look, Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. And it's like, well, you're not understanding what he's saying. He's saying you could continue in sin. Grace would abound. But the point here is, is he's making is why, I mean, how can, how can you do that if you're, you know, why would you even think about doing that? Okay, so let me just explain. The grace abounds even if we continue to sin. It's just, the problem is, it's just too hard for people to comprehend that their efforts have nothing to do with their salvation. And that's just too hard. People don't understand that. Even if they can accept the fact that, you know, they're, that they, uh, you know, just by faith can receive the free gift. Because once you show them that in the Bible, it's pretty clear. And they'll go, oh, yeah, that's true. It's a free gift. You know what they often still want to do is say, but I've got to keep working to keep that gift, right? I mean, they, something, they want to add their works to it because... You know, and it is, there's a lot of commandments and stuff in the Bible. And so people don't understand that. They don't understand what, you know, what that, what that's all about. But, uh, but ultimately what it comes down is just this desire to glorify ourselves and say, look how good I am. This is why over and over it talks about not, you know, you don't want to be boasting. And if you could get to heaven by your works, you'd have something to boast about. Look how good I am. I earned my way to heaven. And so it's so clear that the Bible says, that that is not part of our salvation, but it's so hard for people to let go. A guy I was preaching to on Saturday, uh, yesterday, he said, uh, you know, just, he's listening. He, he was one of those guys that's honest. This is kind of, usually you have the best uh, results with somebody that says, you know, I hope I would go to heaven, but I really don't know for sure. I mean, if they say any other answer that we're probably, we're kind of like trying to move them to say that ex exact thing, you know? So if they say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. We want to talk them down <laughs> to the point of saying, well, you're right. I have sent, maybe I wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. <laughs> That's what we want them to say. Well, this guy just flat out said, I would hope so, but I, I just don't know. And I basically, you know, can I show you? And he says, sure. And I start showing him and, uh, you know, I went through the whole thing and it seemed like it was making sense. It seemed like he got, he's understanding the gift. He was understanding it's God's grace and we, why we can't work. I showed him over and over. It's a gift of God. We can't, we can't 
do the works or else we would have something to boast about. And God wants the glory without faith. It's impossible to please God. I mean, he's following along. He's, he's giving me all the right answers. <clears throat> and then at one point towards the end, he, he, he's like, yeah, but I believe that you can't just put your faith. It's not just like a one-time deal. It's like every day you have to keep putting your faith. Cause he was like following me. Right. He's following okay, his faith and all this. But he's like, every day you got to just keep putting the faith, because if you stop having faith, then you're not going to go to heaven. And what he was doing is he's saying, it's got to be my effort. You know, people just don't want to understand. They just can't understand that it's not your effort at all. And so he's wanting to still hold on to that. So I went through the whole thing about eternal security. And I said, you know, I understand where you're coming from. This idea that like, how could you receive a free gift of salvation and then just go do whatever you want or whatever. But I want you to understand, you know, that, that it has nothing to do with your works. And uh, my mind always goes back to the time we did a follow-up visit. I'm sure you've heard this. Most of you heard this story, but I did a follow-up visit of somebody brother Austin had led to the Lord. I didn't know who had led him to the Lord at the time until I came back and talked to him. But uh, we were uh, at that house and uh, when I started talking to her, she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. A guy came to my house. She's like, I remember because he said that somebody could commit murder and still go to heaven. <laughs> He's like, somebody, after they get saved, they could commit murder and they could still go to heaven. And she was just perplexed. And later on, Brother Austin said, whenever he told her that, she was calling her husband, come here. This guy just said you could commit murder and still go to heaven. You know, I don't know why she is so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of makes you worry. But uh, but so once she got that eternal security down, because she had told Brother Austin, hey, I've been to a lot of different churches. I think it was more like, uh, you know, the non-denominational type churches. She said they never could, under, uh, never could explain to me the eternal security thing. So once she got that, then he was able to lead her uh, prayer. And by faith, she received Jesus Christ and not her works. But see, until they understand that it has no part of their, it's no part of their own works. They actually have to let go of that. You know, <clears throat> uh, this is why it's so funny when people talk about the repenting of your sins and they make a big deal about that. And I think it was Curtis Hudson that was like, you need to repent of your repenting. <laughs> right? If you think that I need to repent of my sins to get saved, you need to repent of that because you're wrong. Uh, it's, it, you know, you have to repent in what you're trusting in to get you to heaven. And once you trust in Jesus Christ alone, you know, yeah, now there's a repentance of sin and stuff that, that might happen afterwards. Uh, that's another story. That's a different different matter, which we'll talk about here in a second. Okay, so there are some reasonable conversations you can have. To be quite honest, I don't even really get into these at the door because I don't think it's it's all super important uh, to, to like debate this subject or anything. But when somebody who claims to be a believer, right? And they've given all the right information, but they claim that, you know, if a person is saved, then they will do works and their life will change and all that uh, to some degree. Now, I, I, I just try to back them off of that and show them that, hey, like, don't rely on your works, though, for salvation. You need to understand that. But if you want to make the argument that, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come in and God's going to chasten you and all these things, and so your life will change, well, if, if it's going to happen no matter what, then you don't have to worry about it, right? We just preach the gospel. If it's going to happen, no matter what, it'll happen. Okay. But there are lots of debates that you could get into and all that kind of stuff, but we're not interested in that. We're just trying to preach them, preach to them the gospel. And so that leads to the next point of what's being made with the point that's being made here in chapter six is of course we shouldn't sin, you know, cause that's the big thing. Well, you're just giving people a license to sin. Well, look, people are going to sin no matter whether I give them a license or not. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is, no, you shouldn't sin. Nobody should sin. But as a child of God, like you, you, you're not, you're not part of that anymore. Like you, you, you have a different uh, function. Like you're not under sin anymore. And so, of course, you're not supposed to sin. Of course, you shouldn't sin. So here's what it says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I, I don't know, I've heard, again, debates about this word should, you know, but to me, should means you should. <laughs> you know, not necessarily that you will or you shall, but you should, okay? You know, shall, sh you know, shall, we, uh, shall we continue in, uh, in sin? God forbid. He says uh, in, in uh, verse 4, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, let me explain real well. Let me actually keep reading and then I'll back, back up. For if we have been <clears throat> planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from, freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For if that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, look, there are some places in that little section right there that will trip people up. And they're saying, hey, we're dead to sin, and so you're not going to sin anymore. And I've heard people make that argument. Like, I mean, I've told a flat-out works-based salvation. People say, look, if you're saved, then you won't sin anymore. <clears throat> Here's the deal. This is chapter 6, which means we just had chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You can't deny in all those other chapters what is being said. So to all of a sudden read that into this text, you're missing something. So you have to back up and say, look, I've got something wrong. Not only that, it's going to go on in the next chapter to even strengthen the argument even more. And so what he's saying here isn't that if, you, uh, you know, if you're saved, then, then you're like Christ and you're not going to sin because Christ doesn't sin or something like that. That's not what he's saying. Okay, here's the idea. <clears throat> um, we have been baptized into Christ. Now here is, I think, the, the big misunderstanding uh, in Christendom as a whole when it comes, I'm talking about those who would claim to be Christ, Christians, not, not true believers, but those who would claim to be Christians and their understanding of baptism, because I would say the majority of denominations out there put an emphasis on baptism, Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Episcopalian, I mean, all of these uh, Church of Christ, like like if you ask them what they need to be what they need to do to be saved, they might say we just believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized. I mean, you know what I mean? They're going to throw that in there because they put an emphasis on baptism. Here's what I think. Here's the point that I think that people are missing when they read these verses about baptism. They're making it all about water, and the and the opposite is true. When we're baptized, we are baptized into Christ. We're in Christ and Christ is in us. I mean, you know, the word baptism means to immerse. This is why we put people underwater because that's what baptism literally means, which is so funny, you know, that people would sprinkle. Uh, Braden and I were just talking about this the other day, how they will, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture like a painting uh, and they've got like, they're in this big body of water and they stand down into it. I mean, because you, cause you re can't read the Bible and not realize that they went down into the water, right? <laughs> they, where are we going to baptize? Well, here's a great body of water. Let's go down into the water. And then in the painting, you got, like, for instance, at Jesus' baptism, you got Jesus standing in knee-deep water. You know, he doesn't go out too far. I guess he doesn't want to get completely wet. And then you got John the Baptist pouring some water on his head. <laughs> it's like... You could have done that. You could have got out your little flask. <laughs> I don't know if flask wasn't the right word. <laughs> water bottle. There you go. And put and pour some water on his head. But, oh, no, you got to go down into the water. Well, see, the reason why they went down into the water is because baptism means to dunk, if you will, you know, go into the water, come out of the water, to be immersed in that, in that water. So when we go into Christ. Now we don't come back out of Christ, but we go into Christ. We're immersed. We're submerged. We're surrounded by, there's another verse that talks about being uh, how the children, when they went through the parting of the Red Sea, and it says they were baptized, and it talks about the cloud that was above them, and then the water that was around them. And so the idea is that they're just surrounded. They're covered 
You know? So when we're baptized into Christ, really that's kind of another way, if you think about it, of saying we're sealed. You know, the Holy Spirit seals us, to, uh, seals us into the day of redemption. We're, we're in Christ. Okay. Now, when we baptize somebody in water, what we're doing is we're symbolizing. It's a picture. It's a token of what happened in Christ. Okay. So just like we, we are now in Christ, we go into the water and we say we're buried with Christ and we're resurrected with Christ. Okay? So here's what it says. Uh, therefore, this is verse four. We are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the picture is, hey, you, you're dead to your sin. Just like Jesus died, you know, Jesus didn't have any sin, but his physical body died and then it rose up again. Well, you're going to rise up again one day as well. But even right now you could live as though you were resurrected with Christ. You're a new man. Indeed, you are a new man. You know, people will use that scripture too. Hey, be... You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things are become new. I think I mis, mis, <laughs> misquoted that. All things are become new. And they were like, see, there you go right there. If you get saved, everything's going to become new. You're a new creature. You're not going to sin anymore. I mean, whatever they, they try to make that say. And it's like, that's not what he's saying. Because the new man is a spiritual birth. It's not the physical birth. It doesn't have anything to do with this flesh. Now, we should live right in this flesh. But the true... Uh, you know, part of us that's going to go to heaven, the part of us that's sinless and, and, and incorruptible is, uh, is the soul, the inward man. Okay, so he's saying here, if we're baptized into Christ, we should walk in newness of life. And then again, with the illustration of baptism, he talks about being planted. You know, so just like we go into the water, you know, it's just kind of like you take a seed and you put it into the dirt. And then that dirt, that seed dies, the Bible says, and that seed has to die so that the new life will come up through that, uh, through that seed, and you'll get the, the tree that rises up. So these are just all pictures. Okay, so grace abounds even if we were to can willingly continue in sin. However, now our, again, I don't want to get into it right now, but our fellowship with the Lord would be hindered if we just continue to live in sin. You know, we're not going to be able to have the, the power of God in our life that a spirit-filled person who's trying to walk after God and praying and getting right, you know, they're going to have different uh, fellowship and relationship with God. But grace would still abound. You're still going to go to heaven, you know, because all that's through His grace. Number two, of course, we shouldn't continue in sin. <clears throat> Look at, uh, let me see here. Look at Romans 7. The final uh, resurrection hasn't happened yet. So we're obviously bound to this sinful flesh. Okay, so this is where Paul talks about, and this is just the following chapter. Uh, Paul talks about, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, this, this verse, look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now he's going to keep going back and forth and it's going to get confusing because he's talking about the real him, which is the spiritual part, and the old him, which is supposed to be dead, but it's still continuing to, to sin and, and all this. It's at battle, right? He says, for that, it's sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which, I, uh, which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do, uh, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of, uh, of this death? Guess who's going to deliver him? 
Jesus. When he comes back in the resurrection, he takes up our bodies and gives them a new glorified body. Then we'll be delivered from this wretched body. Otherwise, it's going to be a constant, it's just going to be a continual everyday battle between your flesh and the spirit. But the spirit is going to win in the end, right? Because God's grace abounds. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. In case anybody still thinks, well, I just don't know. I think you're, you're going to do works. You know, it's going to get to heaven by your works. There is now, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, this, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And I'll keep, I could keep going, but I'm trying to stick with chapter six the most I can. All right, so uh, of course we shouldn't sin. Uh, number three, go back to chapter six. So grace abounds even if we continue to sin. Of course we shouldn't sin. Number three, it is our job to work at avoiding sin. Now that is our job. Doesn't have anything to do with our sal the salvation of our eternal soul, but it is our job. Okay, so let's. This is where we left off in chapter six. Go to uh, verse eleven. And I want you to notice, I've got it highlighted in my Bible, but notice these words. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, So ultimately, again, you are saved. You have eternal life when you receive Jesus Christ. But now you have a responsibility. And the responsibility is yours, because look what it says. Reckon. You know what that means? I mean, that sounds like an old country word, I know, but uh, I reckon. But reckon means to think about it. Re you know, think about like re reconcile, you know what I mean? Reckon that you are a child of God. You have to remind yourself that daily. Hey, I'm, I'm in Christ now. I'm not of this world. I'm not under sin. I don't have to, I don't have to do the, uh, those things anymore. I'm, I'm a new person. You have to reckon that, though. And then it says, let not sin therefore reign, which means... Who's the one letting, right? You, you're the one making that decision. Don't let it rain. You have control over that. You know, not to obey the, the, the body. And it says, ye, neither yield ye your members. Okay, so all these are things that we have the responsibility to do. Now, there are extreme views out there that are really strange. I feel like this chapter has already put to rest the false belief that we need to work for our salvation. But not only that, I think that this puts to rest the idea that some people have that says man doesn't have any free will. And basically God, you know, has already just preordained, you know, you're going to do these things. And, and, and I mean, that's a radical view, even from a quote unquote Calvinist view. But there are some that believe that if you did something bad, it's just like, well, I mean, it was already ordained. I mean, God knew you were going to do it and, and wanted you to do that. And you didn't have any control over it because you don't have a free will. And that's ridiculous. If you didn't have free will, why would he say reckon yourself? <laughs> you know, yield not your body. Uh, you no, know, because we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to uh, try to live a life that's free from sin. <clears throat> okay, and then the final point is this. We already have eternal life, but we want to serve Jesus in righteousness so that we might bear fruit. Okay, look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, 
but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was del delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, there are a few things that just jumped out to me right there is that, number one, what was it that you obeyed? He doesn't say, but ye have obeyed the commandments of, you know, the Ten Commandments or something like that. No, he says, you obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. You, you, uh, you received the gospel that was taught unto you, and you obeyed that gospel. You received that gospel, okay? Uh, and now, here's another word that jumped out at me, being then made free from sin. Look, that wasn't your, your that's not your doing. You were made free from sin. So when you got saved... I mean, you couldn't get unsaved if you wanted to. <laughs> you were made free from sin, okay? You became this, but you became the servants of righteousness. Now, let me ask you this. Oh, see there, if you're saved, you're a servant of righteousness. Well, that's true, but let me ask you this. Does any master have bad servants? <laughs> of course. They're still his servants. They're just bad servants. You know, does any king have some people in the kingdom that are bad how about David? Did David have any servants that were bad servants? Of course. They were still his servants. They were just bad servants, okay? And the Bible uses that illustration over and over. Jesus teaches parables where he talks about slothful people and unfaithful servants and, and all that. And he's not talking about, uh, you know, for salvation, and at least in some of those parables. It depends on the context. But for the most part, he's just talking about people who are servants of God already, but some of them, you know, they're just not doing the job. God gave him some some uh, talents, which which is a you know for us it's kind of a play on words. That was talking about money, but we think of talents. Like God's given you some gifts and some abilities and some talents. You know you can use those for the Lord, but some people will sit on them and they'll bury their talents and they won't use them for the Lord. Right? That doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not being as fruitful as you could be. You're not being as good of a servant to God as you could be. Therefore, you're not going to have the right relationship. He's not going to give you uh, maybe some responsibilities that he would like to use you to do. And you're not going to get some of the rewards in heaven that you could get if you lived uh, the life that he, want, that, that, that he wants you to. So we have, uh, let me keep reading actually. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, uh, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to uh, righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. And don't let that confuse you because there's a lot of places in the Bible where it says that, like, you know, you're, you're obeying God and you're going to have all these rewards on this earth. And in the end, eternal life. We're, if anyone that's saved has that in the end, okay, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, uh, uh, so that is this verse in context. So in conclusion, there's a lot about there's a lot about eternity that we don't understand, right? I don't know. I, I I wish there was more in the Bible that would explain what heaven's like, but you know why it's not in there? Because I don't think we could understand it. <laughs> I don't think we could process. It. I don't think there's any way that our minds would understand any more than what He already gives us in the Bible, and so He just doesn't He just doesn't tell us. You know, I don't know to what degree we're going to be rewarded. You know, I've heard messages on, these are the crowns that we get. And my mind's thinking like, you know, hey, I want to serve the Lord because I love him, but what am I going to do with a crown? <laughs> you know, how many crowns can you wear on your head? And then some people say, oh, no, no, but the crowns that we get to put at Jesus' feet, right? I understand but all this is analogies because we, we, we can't understand what the rewards are going to be like. I don't understand it. I don't understand to what degree we're going to be servants to him. You know, we're going to be serving him forever. On this earth, if you say that to somebody, hey, you want to be saved for, so that you could be Christ's servant for all eternity? They'd be like, ah, I just don't know about that. <laughs> right? They don't understand that, hey, you'll want to be his servant. You'll want to serve him for all eternity. Uh, they don't understand because we, we, our bodies can understand that. All we can think about is the pleasures and the happiness and the joy that we get in this life right now. 
But I'm telling you, the life to come is going to be filled with things that you couldn't even fathom. Your, your mind couldn't, couldn't understand it. And this is why God didn't put that much of it in the Bible. He just gave you little, bit, little bits and pieces. Now, he did give us an explanation of the millennial kingdom. We can understand that a little bit more. Hey, I want to live on the earth like in the time of the Garden of Eden. right? We can keep, kind of relate to that and say, hey, that'll be great. And I believe that's really going to happen for a thousand years. Now, the, because that's the only part that we can fathom in our mind, there are false, doctrine, false uh, teachers out there like the Mormons who in Jehovah's Witnesses that teach, you know, you, oh, well, you know, that's all you get is just the millennial, millennial kingdom and then it's like heaven on earth for eternity. And we're like, I hope it's a lot better than that. <laughs> but, hey, the conditions like the Garden of Eden and all that, that sounds pretty good. You know, lions and lambs playing together and, and children playing with snakes. How many of you want a pet snake? Right. I mean, not right now you don't, but then you will. They'll be nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many of you want to ride on a tiger or something like that? You know, uh, we can relate to those things in our minds. We can fathom that. We can think about that. But we really don't understand what eternity is going to be like. So what we have to do is by faith realize that one day this life will be over. And whatever happens, I mean, because the, that's the great unknown. Everybody gets scared when it comes down to, hey, your time is short. You know, the doctor tells you you only got a few months to live or something. You're just like, oh, no, what do I do? And it's just so weird to me. I mean, it's not weird because I can kind of understand from a human perspective, but people are like, I only got so much time to live. And there's, I remember hearing that country song that says, I went skydiving and, and a Rocky Mountain climbing and and I did all these things and, and wrote, a, wrote a, a bull named... Uh, what was, come on, some of you, some of you sinners have heard that song. Before. It's the name of a beard. Uh, Fu Manchu. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, if I only had so much time to live, live I'm not riding a bull because it might end shorter than, than I've got. But see, that's just human reasoning. Like, man, I'm just going to live it up with the rest of the time I have. Instead of thinking like, you know what, after this is eternity. So, you know, I, I've known people that got saved in their, in their, you know, later on in their life, like 70s, 80s, and they're just like, man, I've wasted my entire life. I've only got a small time left. I better lay up a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, rewards in heaven, lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, and I think about, you know, I've obviously, uh, by what I'm going to say, you'll understand, but I've never really spent much time investing in like stocks or like retirement fund or anything like that. And that's a, that's an earthly thing. It's not super important. But the principle of it is, hey, your whole life, you know, I remember them teaching me whenever I was 17, 18 years old, hey, if you'll start investing now, you'll be a multimillionaire by the time you're my age, <laughs> what I am now, <laughs> but I didn't do it. And so I'm clearly not a millionaire, but, uh, but the thing is, investors will tell you, well, even if you start late, I may say you're 30 years old, you're 40 years old. What do you do now? Well, you got a little window to just start building up as much as you can. Just put as much as <laughs> you can in there. But it's not going to be anything like it was if you started investing early. But still, we want to make investments in heaven that are going to, uh, you know, give us those rewards, whatever those are going to look like. And, you know, even if we, even though the Bible gives us very little to understand that or to know what that's going to be like, that's the beauty of faith. I mean, isn't it our faith that saves us? Well, hey, we've got to continue to live by faith for the rest of this time on earth and just trusting in not only the fact that God's going to get us to heaven, but that God is going to reward us abundantly for the works that we do on this earth and how, how we go about denying the flesh, how we go about making sacrifices unto him. He told Peter, you know, there's nothing that you give up in this life that you're not going to get a hundredfold in the kingdom. Okay, and so so whatever sacrifices we make, whatever uh, uh, investments we make, the efforts that we that do, the soul winning, all those kinds of things, we're laying up rewards in heaven. And you say, well, I don't see them. Where are they? Just wait. Have faith, because one day, you know, after you die, then you will enter into eternity, whatever it's like, and uh, you will know more about why you should have done uh, what. None of us have done enough of, for sure, in living the holy life and, uh, and the fruitful life that he's called us to. So we could all do better, so that should be our job. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Romans road. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and using him in such a mighty way. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to just learn from your inspired word. 
I believe it, uh, is uh, perfectly inspired from f- from the beginning to the end, and it's given us everything that you want us to know. And I do believe that, and I pray that you help us to strengthen our faith in that, and uh, to do a little more each day uh, to to grow in our knowledge of your word and faith in you and. And just in the works that we do, that we might bring more glory to you and be fruitful and uh, productive for your name. I pray you bless this church and uh, be with us now as we go our separate ways. Keep us safe on the roads. I pray in Jesus' name. Oh, and I pray for those going soul winning too, Lord. Give them uh, uh, encouragement and boldness to preach your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.